Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Fortress America Abroad, Effective Diplomacy and the Future of U.S. Embassies will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection. I ask consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record without objection so allowed. On behalf of the members of the Subcommittee, I want to welcome all of the panel here. Uh, highly distinguished witnesses who are with us today. We're going to discuss challenges as well as the opportunities for the future of United States embassies and diplomacy with four uniquely qualified experts. We'll examine not only the ramifications of the new type of embassies that U.S. taxpayers are currently funding around the world, some call them fortress embassies on the outskirts of towns. We'll also evaluate the broader purposes of our diplomatic presence abroad. We'll discuss how we can best maintain and improve our relations with foreign governments and the people those governments represent. Our diplomats put themselves in harm's way for all of us day and night. They live in every part of the globe, often in remote and austere places that are afflicted by poverty and violence. And they suffer casualties, like Tom Stefani of the Foreign Agricultural Service who was killed by a bomb in Afghanistan last October, or John Granville, a USAID officer killed along with his driver earlier this month in Sudan. We all recognize the need for robust and effective security. Our people deserve it, and our missions cannot be effective without it. At the same time, we have to recognize that the very effectiveness we seek to maintain with that security is threatened if the security measures are not carefully managed. Take the symbolism of the American embassy itself. For generations, the sight of the American flag flying openly in the heart of foreign capitals and oppressive regimes gave hope to dissidents, relief to Americans abroad, and pause to many dictators. Stories are legendary of young people learning in American embassy libraries and cultural centers who would later become leaders of their nations with affection for the United States that they would never forget. And yet our concerns with security have now led us to build new embassy compounds of cookie cutter boxes surrounded by walls located on the outskirts of towns. One magazine called our new embassy in Iraq, for example, Mega Bunker of Baghdad. One of our witnesses today has referred to this phenomenon as Fortress America. But $700 million embassy Baghdad is not the only example. Uh, there are a number of others that uh, we're showing slides of them up on the board right now. The more and more the American flag flies on the outskirts of foreign capitals, remote from daily life, from inside the fortified perimeter of a massive bunker. In the words of one commentator, these embassies are the artifacts of fear. My concern is that our diplomats are at risk of alienation of becoming unable to communicate face to face with the very people they must try to understand and to influence. They are at risk of irrelevance. I don't think that anybody on this panel here today claims to have the answers for the very difficult questions that confront us. Questions of safety, of cost, and of the best way to conduct diplomacy in this post 9-11 world. That's why we've assembled such an extremely great group of uh, experts here for us to ask these tough questions and to learn from the collective years of experience, personal and professional study uh, that these witnesses have given. For example, if diplomats can't meet with their counterparts, travel the country and get to know people, what purpose do they serve? Why is the symbolism of embassies and what messages do they, what is the symbolism of embassies? And what messages do they send to the host country and its people? What positive symbols should our embassies be sending? Is the symbolism important? If so, how should this factor be reconciled with other considerations such as security, and fiscal discipline. What are the best ways to protect those serving in our industries, embassies abroad? Do we need to focus not on risk avoidance but on risk management? And how do we do that? How much does heavy security screening reduce casual traffic into American libraries or cultural centers on embassy compounds? How significant is this? And what creative options are there for our acceptable substitutes? How can we best utilize and leverage advanced communications technology in pursuit of diplomacy? especially diplomacy focused directly on the people of a host nation. How is the United States ambassador supposed to control and coordinate the activities of an ever-increasing patchwork of government agencies, especially the large increases of military personnel who do not report to the ambassador but to a distant theater combatant command? Should so-called American presence posts, that is, small expeditionary type offices with a single diplomat in remote but significant foreign cities, be a part of the diplomatic puzzle? If so, how can we best provide safety and the necessary manpower? If we do not have adequate members 
our numbers of language trained and otherwise adequately prepared personnel to send on these and other missions, which the Government Accountability Office, among others, has documented, how do we get them? In sum, how best could the United States pursue diplomacy in the 21st century? And how can we ensure that we have this discussion before we spend more and more millions of taxpayer dollars on fortress-like embassies or other activities that don't best serve our core and long-term national security needs? Defense Secretary Gates recently stressed, what is clear to me is that there is a need for a dramatic increase in spending on the civilian instruments of national security. Diplomacy, strategic communications, foreign assistance, civic action, and economic reconstruction and development. We must focus our energies beyond the guns and steel of the military. This sentiment about the dangerousness or lack of our lack of investment in diplomatic resources and funding is gaining ground across party lines and ideologies. But how do we best set a goal to get from point A to point B, and just what should point B look like in operational form? In the end, I'm confident that we can do the right thing and get the right balance of security and openness of trained personnel and resources necessary to carry out the vital task of American diplomacy in the 21st century. But we first need a robust and open dialogue among policymakers, <coughs> experts, and the men and women who represent us abroad in the face of great personal sacrifice. I want to again thank our outstanding witnesses for being with us today. I look forward to hearing from your ex expertise and your experience. And at this point, I'd like to ask Mr. Shays for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and welcome to our very distinguished witnesses. A determinant of U.S. success will be the size, scope, and skill of the U.S. diplomatic presence abroad. International economic, political, military, and cultural alignments are changing rapidly. Our diplomatic and interagency staff must be nimble to adapt to these realignments. Adaptability includes having the correct number of people and skill sets in our embassies and the ability to react to changes within a country. Members and staff of this subcommittee have had face-to-face -face discussions with the men and women stationed in our embassies. We hear reports of ambassadors having little more than titular authority to manage non-state department personnel. We hear of continued security concerns, which in many instances have led to limited mobility outside of the walls of the embassy compounds. And of course, we hear reports of embassies in need of additional security upgrades, both in terms of, the, of increased security for embassy personnel and security of physical structures. Congress must address these concerns through continued oversight and potentially with new legislation. In 2002, the subcommittee began investigating the Department of State's right-sizing efforts. We wanted to make sure the U.S. was putting the right people in the right places and in the correct numbers necessary to meet our foreign policy goals. Our subcommittee held three hearings on this topic, including one in April 2003. The April hearing focused on the GAO's review of U.S. diplomatic presence to ensure the appropriate number and types of personnel were being assigned to U.S. embassies and consulates. GAO found staffing projections for new embassy compounds were being developed without a consistent systematic approach or comprehensive right-sizing analysis. GAO recommended the Department of State develop a standard format for projecting staffing requirements and ensure that staffing projects are validated within, within the department. In June 2006, GAO reported State had either implemented GAO's recommendations or was taking steps to implement their recommendations. However, despite State's best efforts thus far, more work needs to be done, and GAO's reports are useful in helping the State Department understand where they can improve their efforts. Further oversight by the subcommittee will be helpful, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on the subcommittee to achieve necessary reforms. Mr. Chairman, we welcome all of our witnesses here today. We truly appreciate their time, their dedication, and expertise. And I think we all look forward to their testimony. And I, I'm going to try to stay to hear the, uh, the testimony. I, I have a, s a very important meeting that I have to get to. So if I leave before the conclusion, it's not that I don't think this isn't anything but a very important hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, Mr. Lynch, do you want to make a, a brief remark? I understand. Just brief remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the ranking member. Uh, as well, I, I thank our esteemed panelists uh, for coming before the committee to help us with our work. Uh, I am one who, uh, over the last few years, has come to spend a lot of time in our foreign embassies. Uh, I deeply appreciate the work being done by our State Department, Treasury folks, uh, Defense Department folks, but, uh, and, and I believe that it's really investment in personnel that will cause the greatest uh, improvement in our, in our foreign policy. 
but there is definitely a need to provide a secure environment for, for our folks who work in our embassies. Uh, one that provides security but also allows diplomacy to occur and, and to get out into the, uh, the communities in, in uh, the cities and countries in which we, we are located. And I, I'll rely heavily upon you to, to, to tell us how do we accomplish both of those uh, goals. And uh, again, I, I appreciate all the experience that's, uh, that's on this panel before us this morning and I'm uh, very interested in hearing your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Burton, would you care to make a remark for opening words? No, I don't have any remarks, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thought, uh, Ambassador Pickering, weren't you in the private sector last time I saw you? I am. You are? Yeah, I mean, I thought you were out there making a lot of money, and I didn't know why you were back in <laughs> I'm just teasing you. I thought you were out there having a good time instead of working in Oh, okay. Well, it's nice seeing you, Ambassador. I don't have any comments. Thank I'm you. Here we'll to bring you up to date on what the Ambassador is doing in one moment uh, as we introduce people here. I'm, we're now going to receive the testimony, in fact, from the witnesses before us, and I'd like to begin by introducing them with a little background on each. Uh, Ambassador Mark A. Grossman has served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2001 to 2005, uh, and I guess if we add that with Ambassador Pickering, we've really got from 1997 all the way to 2005 in that position of Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Uh, that's the department's third ranking official and its senior career diplomat. Mr. Grossman has also served as the Director General of the Foreign Service and as Ambassador to Turkey. He's currently the Vice Chairman of the Cohen Group and was co-chair of the Embassy of the Future Commission for the Center for Strategic, uh, Strategic and International Studies, which released its final report last year, and which we'll be discussing at length uh, in this, this morning. Dr. Jane C. Laffler, uh, is an associate professor at the University of Maryland College Park and is the author of The Architecture of American Diplomacy and Fortress America. She's widely recognized as an expert on the history and cultural impact of United States embassy design and construction. Dr. Leffler holds a graduate degree in city planning from Harvard University and a doctorate in American Civilization from George Washington University. She has also written and commented widely on the new embassy compound program and the United States Embassy in Baghdad. Mr. John K. Nayland. Mr. Nayland is currently president of the American Foreign Service Association, the professional association and union representing 28,000 serving and retired Foreign Service personnel. He is a career Foreign Service officer commissioned in 1986 and has written and commented on strategic uh, diplomatic strategy on television and in the print press. Mr. Nayland is a former Army Cavalry officer and has served widely in Latin America, State Department headquarters, and the White House. And Mr. Burton, Ambassador Thomas R. Pickering has served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 1997 to 2001. He has also served as United States Ambassador to Russia, Israel, India, Jordan, El Salvador, Nigeria, and the United Nations. You're that old? <laughs> it's about five minutes in each place. Is what he did. <laughs> Ambassador Pickering is a former Senior Vice President for International Affairs at Boeing and is currently Vice Chairman of Hills and Company. He is also affiliated with many non-governmental organizations, including the International Crisis Group, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and Ambassador Pickering, just on that, you served a considerable amount of time in, in some of those locations as well. Was it four years in Jordan? Three years in Israel? You know, on that. So I want to thank all of you for your uh, expertise and, and for your service to those that have been in the Foreign Service. It's the policy of this subcommittee to swear you before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The re record will please re record that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Your written statements are going to be put in their entirety uh, in the record, and, and Mr. Grossman, the report from your uh, organization will also be placed on the record without objection, so ordered. Uh, we do have a five-minute time limitation, as you see on the lights there. Uh, we try to be a little generous with that because what you have to say is important and we want to hear as much as we can uh, without trying to seem rude if, we, rude if we think we're going extremely over the five minutes. We may just interrupt and ask you to wind it up on that point in time. But Ambassador Grossman would uh, really like to hear your remarks at this time. Sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, Mr. Shays and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to testify here today concerning, as you said, Mr. Chairman, the recent commission on the Embassy of the Future, which was sponsored by the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And may I just stop for a moment and thank everyone here for your interest in this subject. And I also heard in the opening statements uh, also a very important point, which is the travel that you are doing and the fact that members of this subcommittee get out and 
uh, are at embassies abroad and see people who are serving abroad. And I, I know that the folks abroad appreciate that, and I certainly do as well. If I could just talk a little bit about how this Embassy of the Future Commission came to be, uh, I think it would provide, I hope, some context for our recommendations. The Embassy of the Future Commission started actually with the idea of the State Department. And um, I had the good fortune to be one of the co-chairs of the commission, uh, along with uh, Ambassador George Argeros, who was Ambassador to Spain, and Ambassador Felix Rohatin, who was the Ambassador to uh, France. And because neither of my other co-chairs live in Washington, D.C., uh, I'll do the best I can to represent them today. It's also worthwhile, I think, and you can see from the report, we had a very distinguished commission. Ambassador Pickering was one of our commissioners, and I thank them for their effort. And I would also say that we had the good fortune to consult with Dr. Laffler and a very lot of good, um, good cooperation from AFSA as well. So we thank everybody here uh, and the organizations that we represent. And Mr. Chairman, I very much appreciate the fact that you would put my written statement and the Commission's report uh, in the record. I appreciate that. As I say, um, the study was conceived at the request of the State Department. The then Undersecretary for Management, Henrietta Four, was in touch with CSIS, and she asked that organization if it might be possible for them to survey the State Department's program to modernize its embassies and to make recommendations about how to improve the functions of the embassies. I also want to say that the, the commission study was funded by the Una Chapman Cox Foundation, which is a private foundation whose commitment is to better the life of people uh, in the Foreign Service. And as the chairman said, we reported our findings to the State Department at the end of last year, including a briefing to Secretary Rice, and we made our findings public in October uh, of last year. Mr. Chairman, I would tell you and members of the committee that when CSIS first conceived of this report, they were focused on the buildings, and they envisioned it as a study that would examine the structures uh, of the embassy, because as Mr. Chairman, uh, you said, there's a debate inside, outside the State Department about what these structures are all about. Do we have the right ones? Are, are they in the right place? How are they affecting the work of our diplomats? But as you said in your opening statement with all of those questions, our commissioners, once we got started, recognized that this agenda was much too narrow and that the issue was really how do you get the most effective foreign policy and diplomacy for the United States in the 21st century. And this came to us as an issue that was more fundamental, bigger, if you will, than the buildings themselves. And I'm not saying the buildings are not important and I look forward to the discussion today, but the issue for the commission was how do you get diplomats ready to do the 21st century job? And so that was the focus of our work. And if you'd allow me, I'll tell you a little bit about it in our recommendations. First of all, it's really important to recognize, as you did, Mr. Chairman, as Mr. Shays did and Mr. Lynch did, that the job that diplomats are doing today is changing. It isn't the same job that John Nayland and Ambassador Pickering and I had when we joined the Foreign Service. It's now a, a job that has to do with activity. It's not just about reporting and sending back uh, information for others to make decisions. It's about all the active things that our people are required to do, to get out, to speak to individuals, to get out into societies. And that's a different kind of job. It's a 21st century job. And sure, there are, as we said in the commission, the traditional things will continue to be done. You have to go and visit the foreign ministry. You have to go visit the government. But if you're not out now with individuals and political parties and students and in the culture of these societies, we believed as a commission that we were missing a very big set of opportunities for the United States of America. So the first fundamental thing that the Commission dealt with was that the job of diplomats is changing. And we also recognize that the State Department over the past few years has started to make some changes. We see what Secretary Albright, Secretary Powell, Secretary Rice uh, have done, but we concluded that much, much more needed to be done. And I would say, sir, that one of the things that we hoped to have in our report was the kind of report where people could open it up over at the State Department, start reading, and say, yes, we could do these things. It isn't huge philosophy and a PhD thesis on this, that, or the other thing. These are recommendations, 20 or 25 recommendations that people could do if they had the will, uh, and we hope that they will. These recommendations go like this. First, people. And as Mr. Lynch said in his uh, opening comments, we think that we concluded that without the right number of people, everything else isn't going to work. And the Commission recommends the hiring over the next three years of 1,079 new Foreign Service people. And the reason for that is, is that we believe the department ought to have enough people to train people. 
and to have people moving without having to have losses uh, at the various embassies. And as I say, without this, we believe, nothing else matters. And so this number is a number that we've believed in. Uh, we believe it's a good number and a number we could justify, uh, but it's something we hope the State Department uh, will move on, and I hope also with the, um, with the support of the Congress. Our logic then went like this. If it was right, sir, that we needed more people, we can't just have more people. They have to do this new job. And to do this new job, they need two things. First, they need better training. And so they need training in better security practices. They need training in the cultural affairs. They need more language training. They need a way to learn how to interact um, with these societies. And secondly, that they need new technology. And the technologies that are out there in order to enhance the job of this new diplomacy are legion whether it's BlackBerry or video conferencing or the internet, these are ways that the State Department could communicate better with itself and also with other government agencies, but also very importantly out um, to societies. We said if that's right, more training, more technology, then you get to the question of platform. And we concluded that the State Department's building program is something that ought to continue, that people have a right to a safe, secure place uh, to work uh, where, they, where, where, they're, where they're working, but that the job is now to get them out of these embassies and, and do the job outside uh, of the walls. And so, as you said, sir, American presence posts, American corners, virtual presence posts, all these things are really important. If the platforms are more dispersed, what do you know? Um, as the committee said, need more authority, as Mr. Shea said, for ambassadors. Because if people are spread out, the ambassador needs the authority uh, to run her or his country team. And final point that I would make is the question of risk management. We concluded as a commission that it's, you, that there, that it's important, obviously, um, that people be protected. But you need to shift from a culture of risk avoidance to risk management. And is that as people are out farther, into these communities, as they're in APPs, as they're in uh, virtual presence posts, what's going to happen? Well, you increase their risk, but they ought to have better training and better protection. But we are, as a society, going to have to deal with the question of pushing our people out into these societies and running the risk uh, that more people will go into harm's way even further um, than they are today. Mr. Chairman, I see that uh, my time is up, um, but we thought that collectively this issue of the right number of people technology, training, platforms dispersed and distributed, more ambassadorial authority, and a shift from risk avoidance to risk management um, would allow us to really say that diplomacy already is a vital tool of national security for the United States. But we hoped as a commission to be able to enhance that thought uh, and open it up for the opportunities that are so evidently available for the United States and the world. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Leffler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Shays. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Shays, for holding this hearing and inviting me to participate. The remarks I'm making now are a summary of those that I've submitted for the record. I'm not an architect nor a diplomat. I'm a historian who studies architecture and public policy. My observations are based on 25 years of research into America's embassy program and its impact on the international landscape. And there are pictures that go with this talk if you want to be distracted a little. They'll help. People ask if architecture really matters when security is such a huge concern. There's no better illustration that it does matter than Congress's instinctively correct decision after 9-11 to maintain the Capitol as its place of business. You might have relocated to a lower profile, less accessible setting, or retreated to home districts and chosen to communicate via teleconference, but you did not. You decided to conduct business here, adding as much security as possible without impeding the business of government or public access to government. During the Civil War, when he might well have stopped construction of the Great Capitol Dome, President Lincoln did not. When the people see the dome rising, he declared, it will be a sign that we intend the Union to go on. Lincoln recognized the power of architecture. Congress has recognized it. When it comes to America's presence abroad, we must recognize it too. Good design conveys good intentions. Well-designed buildings represent the best of modern technology, show our respect for countries that host us around the world, and proclaim our confidence in the future. Sadly, OBO's program, with its cookie-cutter approach to production, which you've mentioned, Mr. Chairman, conveys neither goodwill nor strength. 
To the contrary, it is dotting the global landscape with embassies that resemble big box stores, only they are bigger, more isolated, and far more forbidding than any store designed to attract business or sell a product. And an SED does not belong everywhere any more than a Walmart belongs in Georgetown. With globalization, when we face the world, we face ourselves, and what we see <coughs> matters. The standard embassy design, the SED, is an expedient solution that ignores the message it sends. More than that, it utilizes a design-build process that gives direct control to individual contractors, weakens the government's negotiating role, and minimizes the contribution of architects and other design professionals whose skills are needed now more than ever. For these reasons and more, experts warn that soaring maintenance costs will plague our new embassies. Poor oversight and cut corners are bad news for those who have to live and work in such facilities and for those who maintain them. It might be okay if these buildings were going to be replaced in 10 or 20 years like shopping malls here at home, but they are not. No one would argue that security should be compromised for aesthetic purposes, but as GSA has shown here at home, security is bettered by design excellence. A good overseas example is the new British Embassy in Yemen, which not only meets security requirements, but is also a model of sustainability in a desert climate. We can point to nothing comparable. Anyone who's seen the American flag flying atop U.S. embassies in Prague or London knows what Lincoln meant when he compared the capital to a symbol of strength and a beacon of freedom. And that little arrow in the slide points to the American flag that flew over Prague all through the Cold War and was considered a symbol of strength in that city and a beacon of freedom. It, it's in the picture, but it's hard to see. Our isolated embassy enclaves really platforms for diplomacy, as some maintain, or just platforms for maintaining an overseas presence. Do such facilities support or undermine the expansion of public diplomacy, a key weapon in the war of ideas? Is a design formulated for Kampala really right for The Hague? These questions call for answers, and in seeking answers, we would do well to be guided by the same thinking as those who strive to maintain the openness of the capital. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer recently spoke out on this subject because of his concern that we are allowing security experts to make too many of our decisions about public buildings. We'll end up with buildings that look like our embassy in Chile, he said, deploring it as a fortress. It's not just about money, he said, it's about finding people who listen, who understand that embassies make, quote, a statement that the United States is a democracy and not walling itself off from the world, unquote. Former ambassador to India, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, addressed these issues in 1999. Senator Moynihan saw architecture as a national policy issue and called for an ongoing conversation on how to balance security and openness at home and abroad. That conversation has not yet occurred, but with your help, it can begin now. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have, a, if with your permission, I can have a few more comments that I would like to add to this statement. Right um, one, on minimizing the role of architects, six comments, on minimizing the role of architects in the embassy production process. It should be noted that OBO no longer even hires architects for individual projects. The exception are only the high profile projects such as Berlin and Beijing. Um, and they also abandoned the highly respected peer review panel that served the State Department so well between 1954 and 2004, in its 50th anniversary year and instead created a panel of industry representatives who vied for OBO contracts and simply rubber stamped the director's policies. Two, architectural sophistication and cultural expectation are serious fa factors to reckon with. Um, both of these matter in places like Oslo or The Hague, both of which are slated to receive SEDs in the near future. These are not third world countries with undeveloped infrastructure. They are places where historic preservation and urban design are taken seriously. We would not want to return to the architectural ego trips of the 50s, but we must ask if a big box prototype will further our interests in Norway or the Netherlands. Three, design excellence can contain costs and enhance security, while standardization can lead to the opposite. And one example, OBO buys all its windows from one vendor. They all meet the same specifications. 
That single window is engineered to withstand blast at 30 meters, the minimum setback for all embassy perimeter walls, but it's being used everywhere, even at distances far exceeding 30 meters. Large embassy compounds have many buildings, some situated far from perimeter walls. This means that a costly fixture is being installed everywhere where a less, many places where a less costly one would meet all requirements. Four, the future of embassies, the right priorities are offensive, not defensive. It is far easier to spend money on security improvements to protect buildings than it is to devise and implement programs such as those that Ambassador Grossman has cited that might diminish the threat of attack and boost respect for America and what it stands for. After all, that should be our first priority. Unfortunately, it is easier to install more bollards or blast protection than it is to devise ways to make such barriers unnecessary. Five, programs designed to centralize services, decentralize services, and reach more people, such as those outlined in the CSIS report, will pose logistical challenges unmet by conventional solutions. It is worth asking whether the isolated, fortress-like embassy even provides the security it advertises if many diplomats must travel outside its confines to do their work and many employees live beyond its walls. And six, Congress is the one that determines our face abroad. The only reason the building program expanded so dramatically in the 50s was because it was funded through frozen counterpart funds, not new tax dollars. The only reason it expanded so dramatically in the last decade was to avoid a repeat of the tragic bombings of our embassies in East Africa. That is reason enough to build better buildings, of course, but a country like ours can do better at what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. You found a unique way to get around the five-minute rule, and I, I commend you for it. <laughs> I was, whenever, I'm sorry, no, I was I really appreciative of it. We wanted to hear what staff. you had to say, but whenever I see colored paper un hidden underneath the, the white statement, I'm going to know it's coming from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nalen, please, your remarks are welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, subcommittee members, the American Foreign Service Association welcomes this opportunity to discuss the future of U.S. embassies. We are grateful to you for convening this hearing. In fact, we're grateful for any interest given to uh, diplomacy and development assistance. Our embassies are bricks and mortar platforms for projecting U.S. influence in foreign lands. As such, their design, location, and accessibility certainly matter. But as the CSIS Embassy of the Future Report stresses, diplomacy is foremost about people, our diplomats and their capacity to carry out their missions. Thus, I will focus on the human element of the Embassy of the Future. The Foreign Service is a worldwide available core of professionals with abilities essential to foreign policy development and implementation. Foreign Service members possess, need to possess a range of abilities, including foreign language fluency, area knowledge, management skills, public diplomacy skills, and job-specific functional expertise. Unfortunately, due to chronic understaffing and chronic underinvestment in training, the Foreign Service at State and USAID has long been shortchanged on many of the prerequisites for its own effectiveness. For example, recent, recent data show that the Foreign Service is below 85 percent staffing, short 1,015 positions for overseas and domestic assignments, and short 1,079 positions for training, transit, and temporary needs. A 2006 GAO report found that 29 percent of language designated positions were not filled with language proficient staff. As a result of understaffing and underinvestment in training, today's Foreign Service does not have to a sufficient degree the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for diplomacy and foreign assistance. Future U.S. diplomacy will suffer unless the White House and Congress view staffing our embassies as being no less vital than staffing our military units. Future diplomacy will suffer unless the professional development of our diplomats is seen as being no less vital than the professional development of our military. If calling for, for more resources uh, seems self-serving coming from the President of AFSA, please let me quote also recent remarks of the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates. Quote, the Department of Defense has taken on many burdens that might have been assumed by civilian agencies in the past. The military has done an admirable job, but it is no replacement for the real thing civilian involvement and expertise. What is clear to me is that there is a need for a dramatic increase in spending on the civilian instruments of national security." End quote. 
secretary gates clearly recognizes the value of a well staffed and well trained diplomatic corps thus as we think about the embassy of of the future we must not lose sight of the human dimension future u s diplomacy will suffer unless human capital deficits are addressed no matter how well trained u s diplomats are their effectiveness will be limited if they are unwilling or unable to get out beyond the embassy walls to conduct face to face diplomacy fortunately the foreign service has a proud tradition of working the alleys and offices of dangerous foreign cities to promote u s interests but our diplomats face an ever growing shadow of political violence just this month u s a i d officer john granville from mr higgins di district was brutally, brutally assassinated in Sudan, and a U.S. Embassy vehicle was bombed in Lebanon. I have full confidence that my colleagues will continue to volunteer for dangerous assignments and will get out beyond the embassy walls to interact with foreign public. To do so, however, they need more training and full staffing. For example, a diplomat who lacks fluency in the local language may well be hesitant to make contact with a wide variety of segments of the local society. A diplomat who received a fraction of the physical security training that is routinely given to intelligence community officers may well feel ill at ease going out to meet a contact. An ambassador with an understaffed security office may be unable to safeguard the members of his or her mission. Thus, before existing security procedures are revised in the name of risk management, these training and staffing gaps must be closed first. Finally, I must mention an ever-growing disincentive to service abroad that threatens the long-term health of the Foreign Service and with it the future of U.S. diplomatic engagement. I refer to the exclusion of overseas Foreign Service members from receiving the locality pay salary adjustment given to other federal employees. Groups as, such as the intelligence community officers receive the same basic pay overseas that they receive when in the U.S. However, our Foreign Service currently takes a nearly 21 percent cut in base pay when they transfer abroad. Both AFSA and the Bush administration are seeking a legislative correction. I thank Representative Van, Van Hollen of this subcommittee for his support in trying to solve the problem. I encourage others to follow suit. Thank you again for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Nalen. And I think we've all quoted uh, Secretary Gates a little bit here, but I think one of the more interesting comments at the end of that expression was that he actually said he thought that he'd be happy to transfer some of his budget, <laughs> which is almost $700 billion this year, uh, to these other causes. And if we're starting to think about smart power and some of the other hearings that we've had uh, with the in front of this panel or whatever, that may be something we all should take a look at is realigning some of that money so that we get the best security, national security posture out there using all of our resources. Ambassador Pickering, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's an honor to be asked to speak with you today about the embassy of the future in the broadest possible context. I want to try to take the view uh, from 30,000 feet, having just come from the aviation industry, and talk a little bit about the conditions which I think shape the focus that you have on the embassy of the future. Some of the uh, steps that I think need to be taken uh, to make our diplomacy more efficient, both from Washington and the field. Uh, certainly, everything that I mention here as a problem facing the United States is interconnected as never before. Uh, each of these issues is related one to the other and has an influence on the other. I think that we've never faced more difficult problems in our history than we do now. I would note to begin with that globalization itself has changed the focus of diplomacy and its role. And unfortunately, while it has benefited many, it has left many more impoverished. We also have obviously a leadership role to play in the international community given our unrivaled power as an economy and in the military area and we are seeing today some of the influences of changes in our economic situation around the world. Uh, as well as new and old states failing, we have specific new challenges with states like China, India and Russia which can become partners or protagonists depending upon how our diplomacy deals with them. Similarly, we, with the United Nations and others, will have a major role to continue to prop up and help states in Africa and elsewhere which need assistance and help, states which, if we are successful, can move to managing these problems on its own. Terror will continue to be a tactic widely used against our friends, ourselves, and our partners around the world, and we have challenges in the health field with HIV, AIDS, with TB, with malaria, with SARS. 
Just a few months ago, we might have happily ignored some of the interconnectedness of our economies around the world today, as I just mentioned, the subprime crisis and its ramifications is not going to let us forget that. And nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction remain major problems for us, just to list a few on the road. Our role in the world, which I mentioned a moment ago, will continue, I believe, uh, to be foremost. We may be challenged over time by individual states or coalitions, and even while we occupy this particularly significant position, we are not omnipotent. Much of what will have to be done in the world will be accomplished by diplomacy, working and acting with other states. Where we choose to lead, we will be very, very significant, perhaps in some ways, uh, the uh, vital party in that effort. Where we choose not to lead, we will be a vital player in making things happen, and where we choose to oppose, we have an enormous possibility of making sure that things don't happen. Uh, the result is that while we may have been in a unipolar moment for a fleeting time in the last decade, what is true for the future is that we will need cooperation and leadership and diplomacy is the hallmark of that. Force is important, but it will not solve all our problems as we have found out. And in fact, diplomacy not backed up by the use of force is, a f is going to be increasingly ineffective. At the same time, the most important value of force is to be there but not have to be used, and diplomacy can play a role in making that happen. <coughs> what makes for successful diplomacy for us is a careful integration of our people, of our policies, and our presence around the world. And that's what you're hearing is all about. Without these three factors operating smoothly and together, the ability to deliver in the field, out at the spear point in the embassies, will be certainly less than ideal. Our embassies and our missions represent us <coughs> with people, <coughs> with organizations, with countries and nations around the world. And as Mark has pointed out, uh, this particular most dynamic aspect of our diplomacy has increased over the last 10 years in ways that we never foresaw uh, back at the end of the last century. Uh, even more important than the posts themselves, the physical fabric of which, as you have pointed out, Mr. Chairman, is emblematic of our country, are the people who serve us there. These two are inextricably intertwined, and indeed, I think it would be safe to conclude that good people in poor buildings are far and away much better than the opposite. Not that any of us would recommend that we not provide the kind of excellent facilities and tools to do the job that make good people even more effective in our national interest. There are specific recommendations in many of the reports that you will see that are before you and that are very important. I would just mention in summing up a few. In Washington, we need to find new ways uh, to bring our government together. Too much stovepiping has once again resumed. The 1947 National Security Act was designed to try to find ways to prevent that. If our departments and agencies aren't working together, our diplomacy in the field can be much less effective. The State Department itself now has, too, an unusual opportunity uh, to bring new and, I think, important changes to bringing our diplomacy together. We now look at diplomacy in four fields our traditional diplomacy through embassies, our public diplomacy, our development diplomacy through AID, and our new efforts to provide for stabilization and reconstruction. They all should go ahead, in my view, under the umbrella of the Secretary's leadership. There are many challenging and complex tasks to be performed in this area. The fact is that the most vital for you and the most vital for us in seeing how this work can be carried out by our embassies in the field is the funding issue. It's been mentioned before, uh, and I want to reiterate to you again that neither our embassies nor our diplomacy writ large, nor all the various aspects of that, can be successful if they are not funded in ways that bring together and make more synergistic and capable those people who have to do that job overseas. My written statement contains many recommendations. I won't repeat them here. I will just say that it is an honor and pleasure to be asked to come, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Well, thank you all very much, and uh, we're all pleased to have such great expertise and experience before us. Uh, we're going to move on to the question period here. We're under a five-minute rule. If there's five minutes for the questions and answers, with the number of people here, I'm uh, certain that we can probably have more than one round. 
and hopefully get uh, some good information on the record and for our information. So let me, if I might, just uh, begin by asking um, everyone except Dr. Leffler a question of, of what uh, is your opinion of the types of standard buildings that are now going up uh, around the, like the one in Baghdad and others. And uh, Mr. B Ambassador Grossman, did your report make any recommendation with respect to the design and the architecture, whether those should continue as are or whether they should be uh, done on a different basis? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. You'll have to put your microphone on, I'm sorry. Sorry, um, thank you for the question. Uh, first, let me say that I think from, from the perspective of the commission, we decided that Baghdad was unique that if we spent our time figuring out whether Baghdad was right, wrong, or indifferent, that it would distort the recommendations of the commission. So I, I tell you that we did not take a position on Embassy Baghdad, and I just want to be clear about that. But yes, sir, there was a huge conversation went on uh, in the commission about the embassies, uh, and here's what we uh, came to as a recommendation. First of all, uh, we believe that the State Department building program ought to continue. Uh, that people have a right to be in a building that's safe and secure and efficient, and that in, in, in countries in which the United States of America is represented, people ought to have that kind of a building. But we said that, that it should do so uh, under a certain number uh, of, of considerations. First of all, that the department has got to take the approach, as Dr. Leffler said, to combine the questions of security and design, and we felt that there were new ways to do that. Secondly. We also believe that the Secretary of State should be the person who in the end had the capacity to decide where embassies should be located. And there's a huge debate going on in the department about where these things should be. And we thought the Secretary herself or himself should be able to make that decision. Third thing we said was that as she currently, as the Secretary of State makes that decision, that a key factor is that locations remote from urban centers ought to be avoided wherever possible. We recognize that there were some times when that wasn't going to be possible, but as a principle, uh, we thought that the remote locations were a disadvantage uh, to our diplomacy. Next, we as, um, as uh, in the commission said that there are architectural features and arch new ways in thinking about architecture that ought to be uh, included in these design features that, m be, that meet, as we said in the, in the commission, security needs and are consistent with the American values of openness. Um, because as you said, sir, one of the things that we worried about was that we give off this sense of fear. And I would just as a parenthesis, if I could, recognize that it isn't just the new buildings, but if you go to Embassy London, for example, today, or Embassy Paris today, those are buildings that have been there a long time, but they also now, I think, give off uh, this sense of a closed, uh, closing uh, American society. One other important point, uh, and that is that we also highlighted, uh, because it shows the importance of American uh, values, that these embassies ought to be uh, at, the, at the leading edge of environmental standards, and that this is an LEED standard, as it turns out. And there is an embassy in Sofia now that meets these standards, uh, but more and more, uh, ought to, uh, more and more of our embassies uh, ought to do that because it shows uh, the U.S. commitment to those values as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Pickering, you were on that group, so I assume that you either filed a dissent on this or you're in full agreement with Ambassador Grossman. I'm in full agreement with what um, uh, the committee uh, reported and the commission reported. I had two thoughts that I think ought to be considered by you all as you look at this question. One is that it seemed to me lamentable that we didn't do two things with the standard box that we didn't submit it to an architectural context and we didn't provide that the standard box could have different facades in different places. That is standard interior, standard security, but maybe a public face that was more appropriate uh, to the location where it was being put and more appropriate to being symbolic of the United States of America. The second issue is what I would call the hidden hand of funds. I mentioned it a moment ago, but we all know that location was not just a question of security, but how much money we had to spend. And then while obviously buying a large expanse of property in the center of Tokyo would be, I think, wildly expensive beyond the range of comprehension. I know in a couple of cases, because I worked on them when I was undersecretary, had we been able to have more funding, we could have provided more setback closer to the center of the city. We could have been a park-like structure, but accessible 
uh, to the people who needed to have access. A and there I agree with, with, with Mark. We need to provide different kinds of access for different functions within the standard embassy compound to the extent that we can do that. I think we'll go a long way. But those are two or three Thank personal you. ideas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nalen, do you have any comments on that? Yes, sir. I'd the, 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 the view of the rank and file foreign service, I believe, is that beggars can't be choosers. Uh, after the Beirut bombings in 83 and 84, there was a flurry of discussion about the need for secure embassies, but then funding never came. So after the tragedies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, uh, the Foreign Service was just ecstatic that the Congress year after year has appropriated funds for embassy construction. So I think we were just so overwhelmed that the Congress had was going forward with the funding that uh, perhaps that's where people like me kind of stopped thinking about the issue. Uh, the President nominated and the Senate confirmed a very strong-willed person to head uh, the Overseas Building Office. He pushed through uh, a lot of construction that we're very thankful for. But now that he's gone, uh, perhaps it is a time to uh, ask some of these questions. Um, and, and the issue of funding is, is critical. We need a new embassy in Mexico City. But to buy a square block in Mexico City, let alone Tokyo, is, it would cost a lot of money. So funding, uh, so I, I totally agree that we need to, uh, to look at this more. Um, I just hope that the funding continues. And if more funding is needed to buy land in the middle of the center city, then we'll need that funding. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, we're going to give you a chance to fit back later, but it was basically your work that we were commenting on, so I hope you don't feel left out on that. Uh, Mr. Burton, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't take the full five minutes. I, uh, I've been to a lot of our embassies around the world. I've been on the Foreign Affairs Committee for about 25 years. And it, it seems to me that uh, uh, the architectural aspect is, uh, is nice, but security is much more important. Uh, you know, I think about uh, when you mentioned Lincoln a while ago, Ms. Leffler, you know, they used to be able to walk in the White House and wait for the president and get an appointment and go in and see him, you know, and he used to walk, uh, walk down the street. Harry Truman used to walk down the street doing his exercise. You can't do that anymore. And so the, the world has changed dramatically, and it seems to me that the most important thing is to have security for our people, architecturally pleasant if possible, but it should be primarily of concern that we have security for the people. It seems to me a more important uh, issue, in addition to the buildings being uh, uh, secure so that the uh, attacks can't uh, be successful in killing uh, uh, personnel in the embassy, is that we have more trained and better trained uh, personnel. You said you're short of over a thousand people. Uh, it seems to me better trained personnel, and you, could, you can all comment on this, better trained personnel and more personnel who have the ability to bring leaders in these various countries into the embassy if it's not safe to go outside and to discuss with them issues that are very important as far as uh, our relations with those countries. Uh, you mentioned uh, going out and shopping in the areas and those sorts of things, and that, that would be nice, but being realistic in this world, it's, uh, it's very difficult to see that accomplished. So it seems to me of all the things you were talking about, Security is number one, and number two, making sure we have diplomats that are conversant with the culture, the uh, knowledgeable about uh, the various dialects so they can communicate, knowing about the people who uh, are leaders in the community so they can bring them in and discuss the issues of major importance so that we have much better relations. Those are just my observations, but uh, I'd be happy to hear what you have to, have to say about that in your comments. Who are you directing that, Mr. Burton? Well, I can't go back that far. I totally agree with you that we have to be protected and that the world has changed. We're dealing with a very changed circumstance for sure. Um, I only want to point out that really architecture and security are not mutually exclusive or what I'm talking about. They can support one another. And in fact, you can take examples of um, even a sustainable design, for instance, such as Ambassador Grossman mentioned. If you could have an embassy be self-sufficient, if it could have its own uh, energy supply, if it was able to recycle and so forth, it could be a safer place. It wouldn't be dependent. It wouldn't be 
if, if God forbid it were taken over as some of them have been, people wouldn't be suffering for lack of water and so forth, that, that sort of thing. There's lots of advantages in trying to be self-reliant and also uh, energy efficient. But the main thing is that security um, can be augmented and in these places such as Ambassador Pickering mentioned um, where the s land is difficult to come by, um, it takes even more creativity to figure out how to provide security um, in a place which maybe doesn't have uh, 15 acres to work with. Um, and so you really need more creative decisions and the uh, input and, and to accomplish those security goals which are, as you said, the, the most important. Mr. Burton, thank you very much. Um, I think you, I would just want to agree with the points that you made. And as I said in my opening presentation, our logic was that if you don't have the right number of people, all the rest of this is not as relevant. Um, and we felt that the number 1,079 was a defensible number for precisely the reasons that you said, is that it would allow for people to have better training, not just in the languages and the culture, but also in security. And so uh, the logic of the report is you've got to deal with the people question first, training and risk management, and then the building issue is part of this 21st century diplomacy. Security, uh, obviously crucial, but as you said and others have said before you, it's the people. And you're not talking about that much money. Uh, we took a look at the resource implications in the report, and if you were to set out today to hire 1,079 people over three years, it's $198 million. I'm not saying it's not a lot of money, but in the comparison uh, of what else we do as a country, uh, if you could solve this State Department personnel problem for $198 million over three years, I, I think it would be something well worth doing. Thank you. Sir, speaking as the union guy representing the, uh, the Foreign Service, I just have to say that uh, perfect security is always going to be impossible. Uh, you read a profile of someone uh, like Ambassador Ryan Crocker, and no matter where he's been, uh, whatever tough city it's in, been, he's always managed to sneak out the back door of the embassy to go down to meet with his contact to figure out what's going on. And maybe he's not doing that today, but, but as a junior officer and a mid-level officer. So we need a foreign service that, that does that, uh, that does take risks. Uh, the AFSA memorial plaque has 225 names on it of uh, people who, who died in the line of duty. Um, and unfortunately, there are going to be more as the years go on. So, but we have to get outside the walls. Uh, give us the, the securest walls you can. Give us diplomatic security agents and obviously intelligence community colleagues to, to get an idea of what's going on out there. But at some point, uh, there's a continuum uh, with with kind of you know domestic uh, civil service employees on one side and and maybe Navy SEALs on the other end and the Foreign Service is more on the military continuum there we're not you know at the Navy SEAL end but but we we are in harm's way uh, and we need to be in harm's way reasonable risk obviously but uh, speaking as the the Union guy I'm I'm, I'm not gonna say uh, you know put us all in uh, Wichita Kansas and and we'll be safe. We, we've got to be out there. Uh. Thank you. In, in a conversation we had before the hearing, Mr. Uh, Burton, I think the Ambassador Pickering put it right. He said the, the best security is to have no embassy at all. <laughs> 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 Mr. Lynch, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Nalen, it's, uh, it's uh, ironic that you mentioned uh, Ambassador Crocker. I was with him last week in Baghdad. And he mentioned as well that uh, he was uh, stationed in Beirut when the uh, Marine barracks were bombed. So while you emphasize the need some for some flexibility uh, for the ambassador to move around, there's also some, some instances, glaring instances of the need for greater security. <coughs> I wanted to talk to you about, uh, or ask you about uh, the idea of these American presence posts. Uh, uh, this is an initiative that's cited in the the report, uh, the Embassy of the Future. Uh, I, I gather it's an initiative begun under Ambassador Felix Rohatton, um, and this is what a what an American presence post is: the establishment of a small office with one diplomatic officer and a number of small, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a small number of, of locally hired staff uh, in more placed in more remote areas in, in some of these countries. And uh, having just come back from uh, 
uh, Lebanon and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, I'm concerned that these APPs are just, just another word for hostages. Uh, it, it would be, uh, I think, extremely, extremely risky uh, to, to use something like this given the, the current environment. And uh, I, I, just, I, I just have some real misgivings about this and uh, hoping that you could, you could help me with this. Uh, any of you have foreign uh, embassy service, especially uh, Ambassador Pickering. I mean, you've had, you've had uh, uh, a fair share of it yourself, and how, how do you think this thing will work? Mr. Lynch, I'm glad you raised the question, and it's an important one. Um, I was an early supporter of it. I worked with Mark Grossman, with Ambassador Rowatton, in setting up the posts in France. Um, if you asked me, uh, should we do the same in Iraq or in Afghanistan, I would say no. I would be certifiably loony to do that. But there are a number of places around the world where the threat is more moderate, where we have large cities. When I served in Nigeria, we had something like six cities over a million. No one American could name even three of them. But they were extremely important for what was going on in the country. They helped to set the political tone. They stimulated the economy. Uh, there are cities in China, <laughs> many of them like that, uh, where we have almost no contact. Uh, Ambassador Roatan proceeded with this, and we, in fact, used that particular approach, which was low key. Apartments in upper stories connected with a small office. Uh, basically, very few office calls on the individual. The individual was out and around. But the mayor knew them. The head of the local French department knew them. The business community knew them. Uh, the NGO community knew them. The American community knew them. And they were extremely important. We gave them no classified work to do. If they had anything that was classified, uh, they could take the train to Paris and spend a day at the embassy. Um, I wanted to do that in a number of places in Russia where we had very low coverage. Um, I faced the problem that in order to do that, we had to come to the Congress to set up a consulate. Uh, that was a year and a half or two year proposition. And as soon as we mentioned that, I had 35 American agencies who all wanted to assign people to that one man post. <laughs> We've gotten away from those. Uh, we would obviously watch the security very carefully. We would train the individual as Mark's report has discussed, in the best security practices of the U.S. government wherever they are. As John Nayland said, uh, drawing on uh, some of our colleagues' training from the intelligence community. Uh, we would use the local employees to help us understand, and there would be absolutely no prohibition on the individual leaving, going to ground, or finding other premises if there were a pickup in uh, security problems and that would be something we would watch very carefully with the intelligence community. And we think that in two-thirds of the world, at least, all of those places where we are not now restricting, say, families for security reasons, these kinds of posts would do a great deal. And Ambassador Rowatton put it very, very clearly. He said, I am willing to give you the people from my embassy compliment because I feel these are 100% more productive than they are working here in the embassy compound in Paris. Uh, and indeed, that has been the significance of this, and it's the reason why we have supported it. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Higgins, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just uh, in reading and listening to the testimony, I'm, I'm struck by the, you know, the emphasis on, on physical plants, on, on infrastructure, and while there seems to be a reference to the human infrastructure, that represents American diplomacy. Um, there should, certainly should be, I think, much more. You know, I think America's problem today uh, is not necessarily Iraq, it's not Afghanistan, it's America's isolation in the world. Uh, we're in these places um, virtually on our own. Sure, there are other countries that are represented there, uh, but disproportionately America's uh, presence uh, is profound. In traveling, uh, to Afghanistan and Pakistan with Mr. Lynch and Mr. Platts. Uh, 
late last year, uh, I was also struck by the American military and their emphasis not only on their military duties, but more on the humanitarian aspect of their job. Uh, I think that's very, very refreshing. And you weren't hearing uh, necessarily from diplomats, but from the military personnel themselves that their mission is equal parts uh, humanitarian and equal parts uh, military. Um, and when we talk about buildings and fortresses, uh, reference was made to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a great admirer of American architecture, uh, primarily because uh, architecture says something about a community. It says something about a nation. And I think when you look at these fortresses uh, that represent American embassies throughout the world, it, it conveys a sense of isolation. And in diplomacy, what it is you need is constructive engagement. You know, the, the author Fareed uh, Zakaria has said that uh, in diplomacy, style is the substance. Uh, I know that it was referenced in the chairman's opening statements and Mr. Nayland's as well about uh, John Michael Granville. Uh, John Michael Granville was not only a, a constituent, he was a kid from the neighborhood. Uh, he grew up a couple of streets away from me. And I spoke with his mom uh, a couple of times on New Year's Day. Uh, John was uh, murdered uh, coming home from a, uh, a New Year's Eve party at the British Embassy in Khartoum. Uh, he was shot five times. Uh, he died about three hours after uh, the incident, and his uh, driver was was uh, was killed instantly. Um, but it was amazing, you know, his mom's uh, uh, admonishment to me as a representative of the United States government. Uh, don't you know feel sorry for us that her son, who she spoke with the night before, always said that the importance of his work, the importance of his work, peace and reconciliation. Uh, in this particular case, trying to reconcile uh, the peace agreement, the 2005 peace agreement between Northern and Southern Sudan after 21 years of bloody civil war. Uh, but the importance of his work far, far outweighed uh, the danger of it. And while a family was grieving, uh, a nation and a community was grieving, uh, there was also this sense of purpose uh, that John Granville's life had represented. And I think it was an extraordinary testament uh, to the great work that diplomats are doing uh, throughout the world. And when you look at, uh, John was with the, uh, the uh, Agency for International Development, the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, but when you look at what's happening in places like Darfur and other places in the continent of Africa and other places in the Middle East, it's these kinds of people that are doing the work of peace and reconciliation who are most susceptible to violence. It's them, it's the non-governmental organizations, because I think when they're doing important work in tough neighborhoods, uh, they become most susceptible uh, to violence because they're truth tellers. And when you look at you know what's happening in, in Darfur, the last thing the Sudanese government wants is Westerners to tell the rest of the world what's really going on there. And journalists and humanitarian workers are thus, and diplomats, uh, are, are thus uh, susceptible to extraordinary, extraordinary uh, violence. So your thoughts on, on those things. And thank you for being here. Who are you directing the, your comments? Because there won't be enough I time, so. I don't think, for everybody to respond to that. Yes, however far it goes. All right, Mr. Gross, Vice Ambassador Gross. Mr. Gonzalez, I certainly don't, uh, I won't be as eloquent as you in, in, in talking about these issues uh, or about Mr. Granville, but if I could just make three points, I think. First, I, I, like with Mr. Burton, I agree with you completely that the issue here is about the people, and Mr. Lynch said this in his opening statement. Um, as I said in my statement, this Embassy of the Future project started with people thinking about it's going to be about the buildings. And the buildings are important, but it's not about the buildings. It's about the people. And it is about, sir, as you said, the jobs that these people do. And what we tried to convey in our report is, is that the job is changing. And that it isn't the same job that I joined when I started in the Foreign Service and popped out 30 years later in retirement. But it's a different job, and a job that Mr. Granville is doing and others were doing. And so it's about the people. And then it's about if you've got the right number of people, you can have the right technology and the right training, and then you can have the right kind of platforms, and very importantly, about security. Second, I think this issue that you raised, sir, about how the military is thinking about its job in a new way 
uh, is very relevant to the point that John Naylan made earlier. And my suggestion to you, or my, my proposition, is that four or five years from now, we're going to continue to see the lines intersect between what our military forces are doing and what our diplomatic forces, if you would allow me, are doing. And that it won't sir, be, as John said, we're not all going to become Navy SEALs, but the job of representing the United States abroad is becoming a more unified operation. It's becoming, in the words of Goldwater Nichols, more purple. And everybody is kind of working to the same task. And I think that's, A, a really positive thing and something that we ought to do all we can to, um, all we can to uh, encourage. Third point um, that I would just make is that I, I just wanted to say that the parents uh, of your constituent and Mr. Granville, I think, hit the nail on the head. Before the hearing, we were talking with the chairman. When I was ambassador to Turkey, um, 1994 to 97, you know, I had people who would say to me, human rights people, human rights, my human rights officers, and they'd say, I want to get out now and go out to Diyarbakir and spend a few weeks out among the people. And I'd say, mm, too dangerous. I, I, I can't talk to your parents if you get hurt or you get killed. But I would say, sir, that after the 9-11, the level of requirement for the risk has gone up. And so now if I was the ambassador to Turkey and I had somebody who was better trained and I had somebody who, as Ambassador Pickering said, had some place to fall back to, and I had some confidence that the mission, as with Mr. Granville, was of the highest priority. And then, God forbid, if somebody got hurt out there, I would be able to face their parents and say, yes, I did this. I, I took these precautions, but I made this decision based upon my analysis of the interests of the United States. And yes, I took that risk, and there was this, there was this challenge. So I think you hit it. You make a very uh, important set of points, and I appreciate the chance to comment on them. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Anybody else you want to hear from on that, Ms. Biggins? Or, I mean, that was a pretty complete conversation. We'll start with you. We'll move on to Ms. Uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. I thank each of you for being here. And I've, I've done a little bit of traveling in my one year, and I'm amazed at how wonderful our embassy personnel are uh, and discouraged that we don't have more of them doing the job. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about training, because I uh, think that obviously is extremely important. Uh, and Ambassador Grossman, you have a lot of experience in this. Uh, what is it that we need to do very concretely and specifically in order to provide a level of training uh, that will meet the current need uh, for our diplomatic corps to be much more influential in our affairs? Thank you, sir. The most important thing that could be done right away would be to hire the 1,079 people. And the reason I say that, Mr. Welsh, is not to avoid the question of training, but to make this point. Every military unit that you can have an arrangement with has a 15% float for training and transit. And that means that they're not stealing from the operational requirements, the readiness of that unit, to have people get the training that they need either to do their current job or to do the job that they might be going on to. When uh, Secretary Powell came to the State Department, uh, no, I understand yeah. about the. Oh, so I, I actually do want to hear about what if we let's assume we hire those folks. Well, what do great. we need to do to train them? Um, I think well, first of all, it'd be a great assumption. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there are three. There are three three very important points. First of all, uh, language training. There needs to be a, a fundamental uh, a fundamental commitment uh, on the part of the department, and I hope supported by the Congress on language training. Second would be the use of new technologies to increase, enhance the capacity uh, of our ability to deal with individuals uh, around uh, societies and to get out among societies. And third, sir, uh, would be uh, security training, so that as we ask people uh, to take more risk, uh, to be out in societies, uh, that they have the capacity to understand uh, the, the, the things that they're looking at and protect themselves. Ambassador Pickering, I thank you very much. You know, I, I've been to a couple of the big embassies, and I would, my sense in talking to young embassy personnel is that as much as the security precautions that are being taken uh, are maybe necessary, uh, they're causing them great frustration because people, my sense, uh, who go into the line of work that you've spent a lifetime doing uh, really want to get out and uh, want to interact and to have to only go out when it's, quote, mission critical sort of defeats the whole process of becoming, uh, of trust, uh, of, of building trust that a successful career diplomat has to do by a kind of acceptance. And 
the, the frustration I have, and I'd really be interested in your comments, is that we're kind of barricading our folks in and not letting them do their job. And it really means that foreign policy is much more politically driven uh, by the necessities of whoever is in the White House with diminishing significant imp uh, in, uh, input uh, from folks uh, who have devoted their careers to trying to get it right in these countries where we have interest. Mr. Welch, I agree with your conclusion and indeed some of the ramifications of this. And let me just add a few points. Uh, we all know that there are posts where we are locked in. Um, and uh, those are posts where we have ongoing battle, high security threat. And obviously, it's up to the ambassadors and the State Department to right size those in light of the job and to recognize we have limited capacity. Um, a friend of mine from the intelligence community said to me the other day that we in the intelligence community need more State Department insight, more State Department reporting, more State Department contacts. Um, this was because traditionally, and I think it is still true, about 80% of the intelligence base of the United States came from State Department reporting, open and classified. And I right. think that that is now missed. That's just one indicator of the value of being able to get out and understand what's going on. Um, wherever I worked, I attempted to encourage my officers to understand the opposition, to be in touch with the opposition, to know what they were thinking, to understand what currents of opinion were out there, what people were thinking in various areas. And it always seemed to me as just a factor of evaluation that you got twice as much value for an hour outside the embassy as you did inside the embassy, uh, and that empowering people to do that. Uh, Russia was a huge country, 11 time zones. Uh, travel was difficult. But we did everything we could to encourage people to travel, to know and understand what was going on across the vastness of that country as a way of understanding what kinds of things were motivating folks in the Kremlin and in the political sphere and in terms of the economy. So I agree with you. I think that, of course, policy is made in Washington, but the field must play what I would call nearly a determinative role in Washington's understanding of what is possible and what might be the options. And without that synergy, it doesn't work. If the field is blind or half blind, the policy can turn out to be something like that, and we have very significant issues. Um, I would just like to address one other point. Our military friends, because they have the funds and the presence, are doing jobs that are very important, but which over time, at least in terms of the detailed training, they were not brought up to do. I think they're doing it well, and I don't want to have this as a note of criticism. But I do believe that the people who spend their lives working on these missions need, obviously, to have the resources, the presence, the capability, so that it doesn't fall back on the military to have to do these jobs, that it is the partnership that Mark described to you, that we find a way to bring that together and to integrate it. And I would just add to Mark's comments, one of the training efforts ought to be to do integrated training, if I could put it this way, across the spectrum, so that people who need to work in the humanitarian area can be trained alongside our military colleagues who are going to have to face that question, so that through training and through doctrine they come out as a team, not basically as two separate stovepipes that only meet at the time of crisis. I think those are all important. Uh, and thank you for the chance to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Thank, thank our you. witnesses on that. You know, I think that last point, and, and we're going to have a second round of questions here. We may not always use our five minutes, but uh, we would like to ask some more questions. Um, I think Secretary Gates, is, uh, you keep quoting over and over again, recognizes it as much or more than anybody that the military's job is, in fact, not to be diplomats and not to be agricultural experts and not to be uh, uh, commerce experts and things of that nature, but they want to complement that to the extent necessary. It's not always 
our best interest to have a military uniform out there as a projection uh, of the United States. There are times we have to have the civilian presence uh, so that people see us differently and, and know that we're looking to try to help them in, in ways that will move their country forward. So I think that's very important in, in how we disperse our money and how we uh, align our pers personnel. What is the situation in the diplomatic corps right now with respect to uh, diversity? Have, uh, is our hiring uh, process getting us the kind of diversity that we need in many of these countries, even getting out and about and trying to mingle with others and do it, it would always be far more complimented, uh, complimented if we in fact had a diverse diplomatic presence. Uh, Mr. Nalen, you probably can best comment on that. The, the main, one of the main purposes of the uh, Foreign Service Act of 1980, the revision uh, in 1980, was to make the Foreign Service look more like America, and a lot of provisions were put in to start to do that. And uh, Ambassador Grossman may be able to answer this more better than I can, but, but over the years, uh, this change has been slow, uh, but the Foreign Service, uh, both generalists and specialists, is increasingly looking more and more like America, and, and if you've spoken to any of the new entry-level officer classes, you can, you can see it. Uh, we have them over to the AFSA headquarters, and on the wall will be a, a picture of a Foreign Service class of 1934, and you can imagine what that looks like. <laughs> uh, and then you have the new uh, officers and specialists coming in. Now, there's a famous war for talent, uh, and uh, Hispanics, African Americans, uh, and others are being courted, at least before the stock market crash, uh, being courted by Wall Street and in uh, a lot of other places. So uh, we don't have, if you take whatever the, the target demographic is, the, the profile of U U.S. college graduates, we are not you know, on that demographic yet, but we're getting closer and closer to it. Um, you know, the Foreign Service, uh, it's, it's in for some rough times right now. Um, every time we in the active Foreign Service raise our voice a little, uh, there are a lot of people out there, uh, not Secretary Gates, uh, but a lot of people out there who, who jump on it to, to say we're wimps or, or whatever. Um, and I, that disturbs me a lot. There are some issues that need to be addressed. Staffing is one. This uh, overseas pay gap is another. Would you go into that a little bit for us, uh, why that gap exists and exactly what it is? Well, in 1990, the Congress passed uh, locality pay legislation that came into effect in 1994. And I guess state and AFSA were asleep at the wheel because the overseas uh, foreign service was excluded. So now a uh, uh, federal government employee in Washington, D.C., uh, gets base pay plus 20.89 percent. Uh, and everywhere in the U.S., uh, continental U.S., employ federal employees get base pay plus at least 13 percent. And what does that 13 percent reflect? It's this convoluted uh, idea of locality pay. It's, it's the cost of, att of attracting talent. To, to the United States? To, to Washington, D.C., or Houston, or San Francisco. That's why they're different locality pay. I didn't, yeah. I didn't vote on this thing, so it's <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically Quickly everybody here will say that they probably didn't need every it. Really everyone used to get base pay, and that was kind of it. But then they put in locality pay, and it's not cost of living, it's some other thing. But uh, the, the Central Intelligence Agency, if I can say those words, their people, if they have any overseas, uh, get Washington locality pay. Uh, other folks, uh, who I can't even mention, uh, if they're overseas, they get Washington locality pay, but the Foreign Service doesn't. Um, and it's now a 21% gap. Now, yes, if you go to Baghdad, you're going to get a large danger pay differential. But 183 of our 286 posts, you now take a pay cut to go to 183 of our posts. And if, if America wasn't a two-income a two-income nation, that probably wouldn't be a, such a huge deal. But it is a two-income nation, but in the Foreign Service, and the uniformed military has this um, to some extent too, uh, our spouses often can't get a job in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, or Tajikistan. And so our family income over a 30-year career takes a major hit, and the retirement savings take a major hit. 
so having this twenty one percent pay cut when you go overseas just adds insult to injury so is that an adverse impact on recruitment generally as well as on getting people to volunteer overseas or just on the volunteering overseas aspect so I don't think it's hurt recruitment yet because frankly no one knows what they're getting into when they when they join the Foreign Service and the State Department certainly on their on their website doesn't highlight this although they do highlight the danger and other issues which is quite extraordinary you ought to there's a little 20 or 40 question you know pretest you can take to see if you're material for the Foreign Service and I bet a lot of people take it and say okay it's something else because there's some real challenges there thank you mr. Lynch I'd be remiss if I did not say how 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 proud I am of our folks in the State Department and the wonderful work they're doing uh, in some pretty dangerous places around the world. Uh, I think that uh, they are a shining example of what is best about America. And uh, I, I, I agree that uh, they are underpaid for the work they're doing and that we need to figure out uh, how best to train them and give them some more help. Uh, I, I would like to ask one question um, about assignment. And uh, that is, uh, how are we handling it now? Mr. Nalen, maybe you, you'd have a pretty good uh, read on this. My understanding is that there's a, there's a pretty good rotation going on now in terms of folks that, uh, you know, might want a shot at uh, the embassy in Paris instead of uh, Baghdad. And uh, I, I know for a while there, some folks would get reassigned to one place for uh, multiple years and that would sort of cause a log jam in the system so that anyone new coming into the system had to pick, you know, uh, Kenya or, uh, you know, Somalia or, or uh, some other place that was a high risk versus having a chance at a somewhat more normal uh, assignment maybe in a uh, European, Western European uh, country. How, how is that being handled right now? Well, sir, what, what needs to be understood is that the normal assignment now is a hardship post. Two thirds of the overseas foreign service posts are now hardship posts. Uh, Paris has been cleaned out repeatedly. Uh, James Baker cleaned it out uh, to send uh, to open up the the Central Asian embassies when the when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Secretary Rice has has cleaned it out uh, to send people to uh, to India and other places. Uh, and so. The, the idea that Foreign Service members are all sitting around Paris and London, uh, it's just absolutely no longer the case. In fact, uh, this is only a little facetious. T to get there now, you, you basically have to serve in a provisional reconstruction team in Iraq and have one of your top five picks guaranteed, and, and that's how, uh, after serving and surviving a year in Iraq, you can, you can get a three-year tour in London or Paris. But the Foreign Service has, has changed a lot. It, it's now mostly hardship posts. Uh, when I joined, I went to, to Bogota, which with Beirut was the only unaccompanied or limited accompanied post. Now we have something like 27 unaccompanied posts or limited accompanied posts. And so, uh, and then we have the, this, the staffing deficit. Uh, this, this whole Ar Iraq fiasco from a couple months ago uh, the, the reason that they didn't automatically immediately have all the volunteers is just that there's a 21 percent staffing gap at the mid-levels. Um, and now Afghanistan, uh, I don't know, this is probably not public, but there, there's, there's, there's a, uh, you know, there's, there's an interest in providing more foreign service and other staffing for Afghanistan. Uh, but from where? Uh, from where? So uh, we just need more people. Um, and allegedly, or we'll see with the President's budget request, uh, apparently the President's budget request next week will we'll ask for a lot of those people. Uh, but my point of view is that the, the President's budget <coughs> request a year ago asked for 254 or 256, I, I believe, additional Foreign Service positions that weren't funded. So, you know. Please uh, fund the additional positions to staff, uh, to hire hire people to staff these places. In, in, in yielding back my time, I just want to say I wasn't suggesting by any any measure that folks are sitting around London or, or, or Paris. 
Uh, I, my question is more toward I, is the rotation system fair so that some of our folks who are in those hardship uh, assignments right now get, get a chance to rotate over, over time to something uh, less perilous, I guess. Sorry. Yes, sir. I, I believe it is. Um, the, the Foreign Service has always takes care of, of people after they've done a hard tour, hardship tour um, in terms of their onward assignment. So I, I think we're still okay there. The truth is um, most Foreign Service members prefer the hardship tours because the morale is better there uh, and the job is more exciting. My, my least favorite tour, uh, with, and I don't want to hurt the feelings of the ambassador from, from Costa Rica, but my least favorite tour was Costa Rica. It's a beautiful place if you've been there, but it was, and this was 20 years ago, it, w it was just boring as all get out. And most Foreign Service people want the challenge. Uh, so yes, uh, if I could get London for, for three years, I might do it, but then I might not. I might, I might want a, 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 a hardship tour. Thank you. Uh, the challenge, Mr. Naylor, is going to see whether the President puts in for 1,079 new positions, which I think Ambassador Grosso said would be about $200 million or less. Over three years, sir. Over three years. And if he has capacity to actually take it out of the defense budget of $700 billion, instead of just creating another $200 million somewhere, that would be a really interesting conversation for this country to have and for Congress to have. Don't hang by your thumbs waiting for it. Uh, however, Mr. Higgins. Yeah, just on this, uh, you know, this, this new vision for diplomacy, uh, you know, when you talk about the importance of, um, of language fluency, when you talk about cultural immersion, um, isn't that hard to achieve in the way that Foreign Service is cur currently structured. It seems as though people are kind of rotated on a pretty regular basis after a short period of time. And for one to become immersed in a culture, for one to develop a language fluency, I would think that, uh, that reach and frequency and, and, and consistency I is important. Yes, sir. Uh, both good questions. Um, let me answer them in this way. First, uh, one of the recommendations of the Commission was that as we train people in language, and cultural immersions, we find ways to move them out of Washington and send them to the country maybe for some months uh, so that they might be able to really live with a family, be at a university, learn the language, learn the culture. Because we do, uh, in my view anyway, much too much language training now only uh, at the Foreign Service Institute. And they do a great job, but as you say, they need to be part of these cultures. I, I tried really hard when I was ambassador to Turkey to get Turkish language speakers for their last few months even to come and live in Turkey without jobs. Their job was to get their language and become immersed. Second question is about, um, kind of wrote the rot goes back a little bit to Mr. Lynch's question about rotation. Y the tension is this, is if somebody goes, let's say, to Turkey, having Turkish language training, and you leave them there four years or five years, it's human nature, uh, after a while, Mr. Higgins, that they kind of forget who it is exactly that they're representing. And you have to break that. I it's just human nature. It's not a criticism of anybody, but we're all subject to it. And so my preference would be, as the Foreign Service does now, if you teach somebody Turkish or Chinese or Arabic, then you'd like them to serve in a country where you can use that language maybe three or four times over their career, maybe not sequentially, but over time. So right. we had a number of people in Turkey who were back for their third tour, for example. But it was broken up with a tour in Bogota or a tour in Prague. And I think that's healthy for the human beings, is, is my observation, having been in the Foreign Service 30 years. Could I add a point there too, Mr. Higgins, because I agree with what Mark has said, and I think the State Department is attempting to do that, is that it's shorter but more frequent tours <coughs> in an area of language specialization. But often, those people come back to the United States, and they serve in the bureaus of the State Department, and they bring back that kind of knowledge, that ability in linguistics, and that informs the policymaking process in a way that I think is very important. And I think that it is rotation of Foreign Service officers that continues to enrich the State Department's ability to have a good perspective on and indeed a real feeling for what is the situation in that country and how and in what way policies can be, be shaped to, to deal with it, as well as dealing with visitors from that country, foreign diplomats, foreign ministers coming here, who in fact expect to see that when they come. So I think it's a, it's a pretty good system and it balances off this problem of localitis, which, which uh, Mark described. It balances off 
the problem of how do you make the best use of that individual. There are other things that have to happen too. Too much focus, too much narrowness, even with rotational assignments, I think tends to produce people who have come up against a glass ceiling. And I think it is also valuable to give specialists in Turkey a little bit of look at some other place where different ideas, different approaches, uh, different innovative ways of thinking about things could help them when they go back to Turkey. So I, I think all of those kind of rotational things are important. I admittedly, you have somebody in a place for 25 years and, and some foreign services have done so. Uh, you may have the world's best expert on a very narrow feature of the landscape, but you may not make the best possible use of that individual. And psychologically, very few individuals are attuned, I think, to spending their lives uh, in, in, in a 25 year assignment to wherever it might be. Uh, it's a little bit the Devil's Island problem. Could, could I just briefly mention, in, in the, <coughs> this is in the uh, CSIS, CSIS report, uh, we do have foreign service members who are posted in a country for 30 or 40 years. They're the foreign service nationals. Uh, and one of the, the many bad things that happened after 9-11 was that uh, some of the, the trust uh, was taken back uh, from foreign service nationals, where only Amer cleared Americans now can, can do a lot of this stuff in the consulate. And, and I'm sure some of that's appropriate, but, but moving forward, if we could give back some more authority to s the, the trusted 30-year foreign service nationals um, who are you know, cleared also, at least to the secret degree, I think that's something we ought to really work at, try to figure out how to do. That's, that's an excellent point and dovetails on what we were all talking about earlier about the, uh, the APPs. Uh, if you're going to have those, you're going to need foreign nationals to sort of buttress the individuals that you put in those facilities and help you with the intelligence and getting along with the culture or whatever. So we do have to move on that. Dr. Leffler, you. Um, just one point on that, picking up on that reference to the APP. Um, if what the CSIS report says is true, and there will be a de-emphasis on the uh, embassy itself and uh, or new ways of doing diplomacy, then that argues for rethinking the infrastructure, this really big, permanent, very, very expensive uh, infrastructure, um, the worst example being Baghdad, but um, similar and lesser examples um, that we're doing around the world. I mean, we the, our, the um, commission report says we should maintain the building program, but we don't know what that shape of that program should be. Well, they don't really mean that. <laughs> I, I, Ambassador Grossman, uh, would I be wrong to characterize the report that no you think I you ought to maintain the building program, but you are also amenable to some of the changes Dr. Leffler and others have talked about in terms of size, in terms of materials, mm -hmm. in terms of goal and, and right. placement, all that? Absolutely right. The, the, the report says maintain the building program because that's a very important thing. Keep building just with, a little better. Yeah, with these considerations about openness and the environment and where they should be placed mm -hmm. and who decides. Right. Um, and very importantly as well, I think, as the report says, maintain those buildings. Mm -hmm. I got the feeling that the commission had actually read Dr. Leffler's book. <laughs> well, <laughs> as, I, as I said in my opening that. statement, we had the good fortune to Thank consult you. with Dr. Leffler. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Wells, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. There's been a emerging uh, almost consensus that there has to be a merger between the military activity and the diplomatic activity. And they've got to work hand in glove. And obviously, there's got to be a, a fair amount of cooperation. Uh, but I'd like to challenge that. Uh, you know, uh, in Iraq, it's in Af Afghanistan, there's two special situations. Uh, but by and large, uh, the work around the world uh, of, of, of trying to provide humanitarian assistance and to the extent that the embassies play a role uh, in that and coordinate uh, USAID activities is by definition civilian, not military, and having people show up and work close as opposed to a, a Humvee or an MRAP uh, to a very rural village sends a totally different message. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm starting to hear is that with this turmoil in our country about how best to address Iraq, uh, there is a uh, mission creep that's being imposed on the military so that in addition to them uh, providing fighting 
uh, terrorist and al-Qaeda and insurgents that are being asked, as we saw, uh, to set up and run prisons, uh, to set up and uh, establish a judicial system. Uh, I met a 55-year-old uh, career prosecutor from my hometown who was out there trying to set up a judicial system. Uh, we've got captains uh, in Ramadi who are trying to figure out how to get the trash collected out there. Uh, and uh, that's a kind of mission creep that uh, it, it's hard for me to see how that would be sustained the moment when and if it ever comes that we come home. But my question is whether it's really sensible to be acting as though your efforts, and I want to ask you, Ambassador Pickering, because you probably have the most experience, should be seen in that way as, as, as essentially a, 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 a an extension of a military policy, uh, or I'll use Iraq as an example, of uh, trying to win hearts and minds, uh, where you're in a, the State Department folks are an extension of that. Uh, and that, in my view, has a significant uh, a negative impact in the long haul about what is the real work that uh, folks like you do. Thank you, Mr. Welch, for raising that question because I can see how an earlier comment I made might have been taken as a generic prescription for all foreign policy as opposed to what it was meant to be, which was a specific prescription in the areas where, for one reason or another, military and civilians have to interrelate. And I would say those are in a couple of cases. They're in the case of active war fighting mm -hmm. in Iraq and Afghanistan, which are at one edge, if you like, of the continuum. A little closer in is peacekeeping, um, the kinds of things that we've done in Bosnia and Kosovo that we and other people are engaged in in many places in Africa, Sudan, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and uh, earlier in places like Liberia and Sierra Leone. A and to me, the point there is that you do need <laughs> to have this interrelationship. You need to have the mutual support, and you need to have the mutual understanding of how that works. More broadly, the interrelationship is what I would call less salient and less pointed in other places. Uh, sure, our military are present in many embassies and they relate to foreign military. And they do everything from training cooperation to joint exercises to mutual support in the intelligence area to many other kinds of things. And here there is a different kind of need for civilian <laughs> understanding and a different set of relationships and that's more easily come by. It is more standard in our diplomatic practice and, in I, uh, and I think in many ways less overwhelming in the sense that the military in the embassies is sized uh, to meet the mission. The mission isn't th that they would run the foreign policy of the country at all. Uh, there are other kinds of areas in the, in the uh, campaign against the use of terror against us uh, where obviously there needs to be a more common understanding of what's happening how it works and where it's going. So I can see several different cases that have to become part of the curriculum rather than the standard basically all out major military effort that we're seeing uh, in Iraq. And what I think has been the difficulty of the civilian side to support that, to mobilize, to find the right people, to train them, uh, to have in fact military understand how and in what way those two can go together and how, in fact, a synergy coming out of that process can work. I would far rather have, in as many places as possible, the U.S. represented by a civilian mufti-dressed individual, wherever that can be done. And I think it meets much more uh, the concerns that we have of the growing antagonism toward the United States around the world, which I think is still borne out in the polling data, particularly in the Islamic world that we need to find uh, important ways to overcome. And, and one of those, I think, is not to make the military the spearhead. Now, I'm a little concerned by the creation of AFRICOM uh, okay. and how AFRICOM, which is the new military organization for Africa, and how it will fit, because it is an apparent possibility that they will see their role as basically if I could put it this way, militarizing African policy. And I think we need to be aware of the fact that they can provide enormous support and terrific help. Uh, but the policy toward Africa needs to be civilianized and it needs to be broadly represented by civilian. Not that the military don't have a portion of that or a serious part to play in making that happen 
often in helping with training in preparing African units for peacekeeping responsibilities, and Africans have tried hard to step up to those in places like Darfur and elsewhere, but they have shortfalls. Uh, but there are vast parts of our policy in Africa uh, that are not militarized, don't need to be militarized, and in fact, we would carry a burden uh, in Africa if we thought uh, to convey the view that they are and will become militarized through Africa. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Thank you, Ambassador. <coughs> I, you hit on a note, I was just showing the staff here that we, I'd written that down myself. We're contemplating having a hearing, in fact, on the AFRICOM mission because we have our own concerns as a committee that it has gone from being focused uh, in one direction and maybe sliding over to the other, I think at great risk to, to us. Uh, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Wells, do you have any further questions? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me simply uh, just ask two last questions on that. One is uh, for the ambassadors. Uh, with the growing variety of individuals that now find themselves located in our various embassies, uh, and particularly the large increase in military personnel there who answer probably to uh, an, another commander other than the ambassador, how are we going to get that so that the ambassador has the right amount of authority to make the embassy and all of the outreach from the embassy really work effectively? Ambassador Pickering. Um, I would say that we have over the years had the president designate for each ambassador, sometimes in a generic way, through a letter, what that ambassador's authorities are. Some of these have morphed over a period of years, but generally speaking, the situation is that unless combat operations are being undertaken by a combatant commander, the person who used to be called the unified commander or the commander in chief, uh, one of the five major US overseas uh, responsible commanders, that the ambassador had full authority. And I think that that needs to be maintained. Uh, I think in your report, but certainly in other reports, Mark, it's been suggested that that, per, per, that particular document be perfected and then incorporated at least in an executive order. So it has the potential to continue from one president to another. This has been seen as a presidential prerogative, an individual prerogative, and it has to be negotiated. Often it takes two or three years in some presidents, even in a four-year term haven't produced this magic letter. Who are but they negotiating with? It's usually negotiated with the White House by the State Department. It but other agencies get, get engaged in it. But the, the effort is obviously since it has to be signed by the President uh, and the State Department often proposes it, that's the negotiating channel for it. But it seems to me we are now ready for a standard document uh, that it ought to become part of the continuing uh, aspect of U.S. regulatory law, if not basically uh, uh, congressionally enacted, but uh, that's another step. Uh, but my recommendation would be that uh, this document be perfected uh, and be signed very early as an executive order and be inherited from one administration to the next unless there are extremely valid reasons to change it. Uh, that provides the legal basis. Then I think the second question is choosing ambassadors. Now, I've served a, a number of times as ambassador. Uh, my own feeling is that to exclude all political appointees is a serious mistake. Um, but I do think that we have many too many appointees, um, and uh, I'm not concerned at all about saying this, who haven't measured up to the job, who have other, who have other training background and experience. Uh, and I'm fond of saying that obviously we all know that the first job that was truly professionalized was brain surgery. So our Army folks did away with this after uh, the Spanish-American and Civil War. Uh, it is time, in my view, to take a look at a smaller percentage. And indeed, in a serious candidate for the president of this country, uh, when he was here in the Senate, suggested 10 percent was the right figure, not the current 33 percent. My view is that that makes a lot of sense, that that allows a president to bring people of ability from outside the Foreign Service. We also, I think, need to be cautious and careful about the foreign service officers we choose. We haven't always had a 100% success rate, but I think the success rate is higher. <coughs> I think more training for ambassadors uh, is well recommended, particularly those who come in from the outside. A two-week training course I is not sufficient to be able to do that. Uh, and I think all of those would be helpful uh, in making the point uh, that in most places around the world, we have civilian activities. I would finally say that if we're successful in this, 
in every place around the world, we will not have to use combatant commanders to carry out our national security and foreign policy uh, because diplomacy can provide that first line, of, if I can call it, of action. I don't like to say defense because diplomacy is uh, offensive as well. The first line of action has to be diplomacy. And I think with successful diplomacy, we have in the past avoided conflicts. I would finally say, and I say in my report to you, that it needs to be backed up by the best military in the world. So I, I don't think that in any way we are tr going to try to reconfigure the balance. We just hopefully can use the diplomacy more effectively and the embassies more effectively to carry that out. Thank you. Actually, I, have one add to all that. I just sure, go ahead. Yes, I was going to add one sentence. Just to prove the fact that we were uh, trying to find out the practicalities of the embassy future, one of the things that was very, very important that we recommended was to put the ambassador in the chain of performance evaluation for all of the people who are represented at the embassy. That would make sense. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Leffel, let's have you have the last word since we, we started off talking about buildings on that. Uh, we've, made, uh, we've created some new courthouses around this country, federal courthouses that are both, uh, I think, unique in, in their architecture in some sense, but somehow always manage to also take care of security issues. Um, your last comments on how we can do that, how the two are not necessarily uh, at odds with each other, that we can have security and we can have uh, architecture that works? Well, the GSA program has shown that, that it is possible, and we hope that um, the State Department can learn from GSA. GSA still has a panel of advisors, architectural advisors. They hire individual architects for individual projects, let them bring their creativity and know-how and engineering and design skills to the projects. And we have um, wonderful um, solutions such as the courthouse in Boston um, or the courthouse in Phoenix or the courthouse um, in San Francisco. So I hope that um, we can take some tips from the GSA program and see if we could apply some of that know-how um, to, the, to the building program. This is a time of opportunity for that building program with a no director at the present um, and a new one to be obviously appointed. So new direction is on the horizon. Thank you. And, and I note that on January 22nd of 2008, uh, there was a letter from the uh, executive vice president and the chief executive officer of the American Institute of Architects to uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice making those recommendations exactly on that. And we ask that that be entered on the record without objection. It is. I, I want to thank all of our expert witnesses here today. Your experience has been invaluable to us. Uh, your comments were deep and insightful. Uh, and we hope that we're going to uh, continue on. We'll get a uh, debriefing later on for what legislation might be necessary. I suspect that there may not be a lot of legislation, but more appropriation, uh, as well as just a way to help the administration work its way through some of these uh, broad details on that. Thank you all very, very much for your time and for your thank knowledge. You, thank you.